Hello, and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab Talk. I'm Sarah Wallison. I'm the director of the lab. Today is our last uh, talk for the semester, but we have a wonderful speaker, Jax DeLuca, who's the director of the Media Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts. She oversees a national portfolio of federal grants for US-based organizations and supporting artistic practices in film, video, audio, immersive media, and other emergent technology forms as they arise. She also leads strategic field building initiatives. And she's, I have to say, a real force and bring so much energy and support to this field. Uh, I've been in meetings with her that she's convened around uh, um, uh, sustainability and impact. And most recently, uh, she created together with Sundance, the independent film and media arts network that looks at regional infrastructure and focuses on equity and sustainability. Um, today, she's going to talk to us about a report that she commissioned. It's called Tech as Art, Supporting Artists Who Use Technology as a Creative Medium. It has not been released yet, so we're getting a sneak preview. It's been uh, commissioned together with Ford and Knight Foundation, and it really has the goal of um, supporting um, artists and raising visibility and leveraging further support for this field of practice. Um, it's based on research, which provides insight into the existing creative ecosystem, the challenges, opportunities facing artists and organizations working at this intersection of arts and technology. So before I pass it over to uh, Jax, I just wanted to remind people when you have questions at the end, we will have time at the end for your questions. Um, please put them in the Q&A. So without further ado, uh, Jax DeLuca. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm so excited to be here and have the opportunity to talk about the uh, publication and the field scan before it's actually released. Um, and uh, this is such an amazing group and MIT has done so much work in this field as well. So I highly respect uh, all the work that um, MIT and Sarah and Kat uh, have, been, have been doing. So I'm gonna share my screen and start a um, presentation. And hopefully that... All right. So um, this is the hello screen. This is where I say hello. Um, so as, as many of you are aware and that, that, that Sarah just mentioned, our agency has actually been um, conducting an arts and technology field scan. This is a national research study that's conducted in partnership with Ford and Knight Foundation. Um, and as she mentioned, I'll be providing a sneak preview of the preliminary findings and the key takeaways. Um, and throughout the session, I would do welcome you to generate any discussion in, your, in, the, in the chat box. Um, and for anybody who's on the um, call right now, if you would like to stay in contact afterwards or um, kind of network as this presentation goes on, feel free to share your name, your organization affiliation, and contact information in the chat box. Um, and this is actually really helpful for me too afterwards, so I can kind of like circle back um, as needed. Um, and hopefully we get uh, the thinking caps on to brainstorm some ways to support this field of technology-centered arts. So in order to give a little context to why the field scan is significant for the arts endowment, I do just wanna talk a little bit about um, my backstory on how this project came about. Um, I went to school in a small village at Alfred University and they had um, an integrated electronic arts program uh, originally, I had started a course in marketing and persuasion, but I really decided that that path wasn't the right fit for me. So instead, um, I decided to make up my own major that was um, exploring the aesthetics of communication through video and sound. And during this time, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Pierre Boda, really uh, was working with um, video imaging and processing tools. And so for him, it's really about exploring the hidden coding and the control structures of the video signal. So it was very different um, than just picking up a video camera and letting it roll. He was really taking apart the medium. Um, Andrew Deutsch was another one of my mentors at this college and here he is with a modular synthesizer, uh, either processing audio or processing video with those, um, with that tool. So for him, um, he was really ex experimenting with technology in a way um, that was also, again, very different than a passive consumption, but it was really about um, actively uh, exploring and taking apart 
um, technology in different ways. And it was also about um, exploring like non-traditional uses of media. And at the time, I really had no idea what to make of any of this, um, but I really enjoyed the process because it was about meditating with um, machines and thinking about how you work with a machine as a creative medium. While we were students at Alfred University, a lot of us had the opportunity to participate in residencies at a historic place called the Experimental Television Center. Um, this place was basically Mecca for anybody who was experimenting with video processing tools. And here in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see um, an image of the Pike raster manipulation tool. Uh, this is also known as the Wobulator. Um, this actually, this tool, um, which used um, magnets in the back of the CRT monitor to disrupt the video signal. Um, this tool was actually first assembled in part by an, an early National Endowment for the Arts grant. And it was developed for a program at WNET, which was a community, uh, which is a public media station. Um, so at this point um, in the 70s, that was a time when um, a lot of artists and technologies were really custom creating hardware and software for the real-time manipulation of video signals. Um, and they were kind of reworking devices that were common to television production. And so uh, the Experimental Television Center was really one of North America's preeminent organizations for supporting video art and the emergence of video processing tools. And um, so after my education here at Alfred and stopping into the uh, Experimental Television Center a few times, um, I ended up moving to Buffalo, New York. And there I was uh, starting to volunteer at Squeaky Wheel, which is a film and media arts center. And eventually I had become the executive director of this organization. And I really, I went to Buffalo because I knew that there was a history of media arts pioneers there, uh, early artists such as Woody and Stana Vasilka, Hollis Frampton, uh, and Tony Conrad, who was one of the founding members of Squeaky Wheel. Um, and what was really special about this place is um, Squeaky Wheel was one of those legacy artist run community media centers uh, founded in 1918, 1985 on the principles of democratic access and education using media tools. So by the mid 90s, contemporary artists and tool designers were experimenting in expanded media environments using both digital and analog tools. So Squeaky Wheel had really evolved to offer, offer programming and workshops in more than just film and video. The education programs included support for new emerging media forms. So this includes internet-based art, training on artist-driven software used in live cinema or performance like theater or dance. Um, we were also teaching workshops in Isadora, processing, Max MSP jitter, alongside other classes in robotics and microcontrollers, like learning how to use an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we also had workshops in soldering and circuit vending so it was really all over the map. You had a lot of people experimenting again with new tools that were traditionally used in media. So um, during my time as the director at Squeaky, I launched a residency program that provided artists with the tailored access to facilities, equipment, uh, technology, technical consultation and mentorship. And these services were provided in part by Squeaky Wheel um, and our roster of artist instructors, but also um, it really was bringing together resources from other community partners like the Buffalo Game Space and um, a maker space. So this was just a way to bring together different communities of artists and technologies and organizations who were all kind of working with the same tools, but didn't quite realize they were part of the same community. So uh, we all know how easy it is to accidentally reinforce silos between discipline-based practices and academic and cultural institutions. So anyway, fast forward to 2016, I joined the, um, the National Endowment for the Arts to manage the federal funding portfolio supporting media arts. And after looking through the portfolio, it was a bit surprising to learn that a large number of grants and project applications were coming from traditional film and television broadcasting institutions. And this was a surprise because it was so different than what my experience in the media arts field was. And I was really curious to figure out how to improve the situation. And um, so I was really searching around for some outside perspective. And it turns out two years earlier in 2014, 
someone had experienced a very similar surprise. And this was this someone was no other than Golan Levin, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with his name. Uh, but for those of you who aren't, uh, Golan is an artist technology, um, artist technologist running the studio for creative inquiry at Carnegie Mellon University. And so for him, he wrote this open letter to the Arts Endowment, which is pretty amazing. And for the key things here, he was really concerned about who was not listed. And so for him, uh, he was really talking about emerging media and how come there aren't more applicants coming in for interactive art and generative art and um, all of these network art forms. So um, he was uh, right on and I, I, honestly, this, was kind of an amazing thing to come across. And um, in this letter, which he has online on his website, he does um, talk a bit about, um, he mentions out of the 61 awards in the media arts category, not less than 50 went to curated film festivals. Uh, in addition, um, there were only five awards that had any connection to interactive or computer-based arts. And none of those actually even had a predominant focus on digital arts. So um, I'm, I'm really glad that he kind of uh, instigated this. So um, his letter was really music to my ears. So from here, I've set out on a mission to make sure that projects supporting technology as a creative medium are welcome at the endowment. So here, I just wanted to show you what our funding priorities are in the media arts discipline at the Arts Endowment. And uh, for us, our priorities include support for traditional or expanded forms of storytelling and visual expression using film, cinema, audio, broadcast, new media, creative code, and related formats at the intersection of arts and technology. So um, you'll see that the focus is really not to diminish the more traditional forms of film and media. Uh, it's really about just making sure that everybody's accounted for and welcome. And that also includes um, you know, all the way through to the application review process, we make sure that we have panelists that are coming from uh, the more diverse parts of the field in terms of film and media as well. So um, at the Arts Endowment, uh, we do support a lot of artists, artistic and professional development opportunities like the current New Media Festival, Light Up New Orleans, um, and also things like Culture Hub and iBeam. Um, we're also supporting a few incubators that are bringing together different artistic disciplines. So Musical Theater Factory is launching a, a musical theater and technology incubator, and they're working with augmented reality and VR in, for theater. Uh, we're also supporting residencies through um, residencies focused on uh, developing open source software. And we also support the Processing Foundation's fellowships, which is also a really wonderful resource. Processing Foundation is an open source software toolkit, which you will learn more about during this presentation. So um, I'll talk more about the upcoming grant opportunities at the end of this presentation. But for now, I just want to switch gears and tell you about the Arts and Tech Field Scan. So, um, we have a report that uh, will be coming out in June, 2021. And the purpose is really to educate funders and service providers about this field. We're also really interested in supporting um, and strengthening the infrastructure that is supporting artists and really improving the funding, the programs, the resources. And um, also our goal is to really raise the visibility and awareness of technology-centered artists and showing other people um, what this work is all about and what the values and uh, the impact of such work uh, can result in. So uh, before we dive into specifics, I do wanna give again, a huge thank you to Ford Foundation and Knight Foundation for joining forces with our team on this project. Without them, this would not be possible. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the work of Eight Bridges and Dot Connector Studio. Those are two of our contracted researchers who have been conducting this research with us. And really this would have not been possible. Um, it's been a mammoth amount of um, mammoth project. We call it um, the monster <laughs> at, our, at our organization. So anyway, that aside, um, we have been working with a technical working group comprised of field experts to provide the subject matter expertise and just make sure that our research was uh, on par with what people's um, perspective of the field was. So 
Um, as you can see, this field scan and publication really has been the work of many. Um, and you'll see that go on is also on our um, technical working group as an advisor. And this is really a fantastic team. So for any of you um, who don't know any of these faces, write them down so you can look it up later. Um, and you'll also see Fox on here uh, at the Center for Advanced Virtuality, also at MIT. Um, so if you are curious to know how we collected the data, um, I will just give you an overview of the roundtable artists who participated. Um, here you'll see a range of artists who are filmmakers and storytellers working with virtual and augmented reality, but we also included those who are working in more experimental forms like audiovisual performance and internet based art, uh, and also people who are just building technology uh, artist driven technologies. So um, all of these artists participated in roundtable discussions in 2019. And in addition, we also held 20 field interviews with practitioners and curators. And we also profiled nine artists in, in case studies about their work and practice. So here again, you'll see a range of um, artists here. Three-Legged Dog works more in the theater performance space. Rafiq Anadol is more uh, sculptural, data-based um, installations. Design IO has done some really engaging, interactive, immersive environments. Uh, Scatter Depth Kit is an organization who had uh, developed a volumetric filmmaking technology, and they're working a lot in the VR space production, the VR production space. Uh, we also have Amelia Winger Bierskin of Wampum Codes and a technologist herself, and Lance Weiler, who is at the uh, Columbia um, Storytelling. Um, oh boy, now I can't get the um, title right, but it's the uh, interactive storytelling arm. I'm making that title up, but Lance Weiler is working at the intersection of film and new media and storytelling. Um, so anyways, um, the data that we collected was within two areas of inquiry. And that was all about seeing how artists engage with technology as an artistic medium and looking at their current sources of support and how they might be improved or sustained. So using these two core research questions, um, we were able to uh, examine the many facets in detail, uh, like their career paths and their trajectories and the different models for supporting these artists. And this also allowed us to uncover the ways that artists are actively challenging the assumptions of technology and better understand the ways they're working with technology to explore power dynamics and build equity within their own communities through skill sharing and discourse. Um, and through this, we really also wanted to demystify the, um, their artistic practice, because as we know, sometimes artists working with technology have very dense artist statements. Um, and we also wanted to unpack the, the creative ecosystem that surrounds their practice. So um, through all of this, we just were focusing on um, exploring all of the stuff. So the case studies that we have also have videos included and those would be released in June. Um, and all of the information that we collected is synthesized and um, packaged up in a 140 page report called Tech as Art, Supporting Artists Using Technology as a Creative Medium. Save the date, uh, June 29th from 3 to 4.30. We will have a big event around this. We'll be having different conversations with artists around this, um, around their practice and really coming up with um, hopefully some tidbits that get your brains going on how to support this field in your role and capacity. So um, keep, be sure to check out our website, arts.gov in the coming weeks to register for the event. It's free and um, we should be announcing it in a few weeks. So uh, the publication starts with an entire section dedicated to help outsiders understand the work of technology-centered artists. We talk about the different ways that artists are creating works by writing code or uh, visualizing data or developing interactive experiences. We talk a lot about how artists are building community by developing shared open source tools, establishing online forums for knowledge exchange and, found, and founding organizations and businesses to uh, really fill that gap that's needed in the field and uh, facilitate the creativity of others. 
We also talk a lot about how artists are critiquing the influence of the technologies on daily, li daily life through works that question pervasive practices like data collection and surveillance, and also their disproportionate impact on communities of color or um, that confront the impact of technologies on the way we relate to ourselves and others. So what's in the report um, is talking a lot about how uh, code, computation, and data are becoming essential building blocks of artistic creation. It's really an essential part of the artist toolbox and the use of code and data acts as a bridge that allows artists to fluidly work across disciplines, genres, and formats. And so while the artists working in this vein might not typically consider themselves as being part of the same field, what actually connects them is their shared practice of centralizing their work around code, data, and computation. So if these aspects are removed, their practice would not exist. So therefore, like paint or pen, code and computation has really become central to the artist toolbox. So for example, the artists featured in uh, this, these images here feature artists using code in very different applications. On the left, we have a performance image of a collective collective called Cody, which is an audiovisual performance collective based on live coding, uh, which is an international movement organized around algo raves where experimental um, multimedia events where music and visuals are produced through coding live. Um, the performers also usually uh, project the code they use to generate the sound and the visuals as they play. In the center, we have an image of Onyx Ashanti. He's an artist that uh, brings together a combination of music, technology, and the art of improvisation. His background is actually as a trained jazz saxophone, a jazz saxophonist and a street musician. Uh, and on his body, you, you'll see that he's made this exoskeleton from 3D printing and combining motion sensors and um, a little bit of computer programming to create this exoskeleton that generates audio by his movements. Um, so on the bottom right is an image of iWriter, which was a collaborative arts project that developed a low cost open source eye tracking system that was designed to allow people with limited mobility to draw using uh, just their eyes. And then on the top right, we have Stephanie Dinkins, who's an artist using and exploring artificial intelligence as a way to examine its impact on society and, the, and communities of color. And also her work has um, even led her, the New York Times to name her as an influencer in the AI space. So um, here we just have kind of a cross section of different practices, but all using the same tools. So it's also important to understand the ways that code, computation, and data can be used as an artistic material. Um, and to illustrate this, I'll use Rafik Anadol as an example. Uh, Rafik has made data sculpture and data painting central to his practice using algorithms as a brush and data as his paint to create elaborate imagery for screens, large scale projections, and immersive installations. And the video that you see here is a project by Rafik created to celebrate the LA Philharmonic's 100 year anniversary. And for this project, Rafik used machine learning to reinterpret nearly 45 terabytes of data, which included more than 16,000 performances worth of audio and images from the New York, um, from the LA Philharmonic's archive. And uh, these digital files were parsed into millions of data points. And then they were categorized by, hundred, by hundreds of attributes using deep neural networks. And uh, the neural networks that Rafik developed from this process acted like a brain. And it was capable of creating all these new connections and memories from 45 terabytes of data that were fed into the network. So the resulting public performance that you see here is using the neural networks to generate new audio and visuals in real time. And this was a way for him to reinterpret the archive and project them back onto the music hall itself. Um, so this was obviously a very uh, general synopsis of a very complex process, uh, but there's a lot of documentation about it. And Rafik is one of the case study artists. So we have a video of him talking more about his really exciting work. In contrast to Rafiq's approach, um, other artists are drawing on data to reinterpret and reconceptualize the world around them. And uh, Tahir Hemphill is one of these artists and he's the founder of the RAC Research Lab, um, which is a team of artists and educators that use RAC 
and data visualization as an access point to engaging communities into social justice oriented data projects. So Tahir also was recently served as a fellow at the Library of Congress, where he had used his artistic practice working with archives and data visualization to challenge the idea of, a, of the library as a neutral space. Uh, his work is very exciting also, so check him out online. We have so many artists in the report, I could talk about them for days. So, um, But this was just a brief introduction to the different ways that code and computation and data are being used by artists in so many ways. So we're going to take this concept one step further, and we are going to talk about tool building. Um, so this is just going back to just um, what we were talking about at the very beginning of this presentation. Um, Tool building, while popular um, in the 70s, is still popular today. It was frequently mentioned as part of the artistic activities in all of our roundtable um, roundtables with the artists. And building creative tools is really a significant pursuit alongside art making. Uh, and artists are still developing software and hardware for both themselves, but also they're making it possible for other artists to benefit from their creations. So a lot of uh, the artists consulted in this field scan consider tool building central to their artistic practice. And they might even self-identify as hackers, circuit vendors, software developers, robotics engineers, or even audio or visual instrument builders. So part of the report helps just put a name on these things. So if you are interested in these topics, you can actually go off into your own wormhole of internet uh, research. So, um, people are developing custom tools on a case-by-case -case basis, which is often determined by need, whether it's to incorporate interactivity into a gallery installation or generate audio visuals. Um, the notion of artists de developing their own tools to produce work isn't, isn't new, and it's really building on those roots established by early pioneers of electronic media art, such as Namjoon Pike. Um, so, uh, hacker spaces, open source software and hardware and code repositories have all really enabled the flourishing of the tool building movement. And some of these uh, tools, if not built for a particular project, will either evolve or grow to underpin multiple or even um, multiple artistic projects or even more commercial projects. So um, here we just have an overview of the tool building process to just give you an idea of what that might look like. Um, and we talk a lot about this in the report. Um, and this is really, again, helping people identify um, tool building as an artistic process versus uh, just something that's a byproduct of a process. So um, a lot of these toolkits are also built around de democratizing access to technologies, which would have otherwise been uh, relatively expensive or impossible to acquire otherwise. Uh, so this would mean like depth scanning and motion tracking. Um, there's also a significant ethos of collectivity in the tool building community. And um, in our field scan report, we include a case study on the Processing Foundation, which is a community of hundreds of thousands of artists, educators, and makers that are actively programming and teaching to program and making creative work with code. The organization is a nonprofit collective, and it also runs an international fellowship program. For example, on the left here is Erin Davey. She is currently a Processing Foundation Fellow, and she is working on an educational series called Creative Coding. And so uh, Creative Coding is all about um, breaking the stereotypes of programming by showing that it can be warm, playful, and sp spontaneous. Another Processing Foundation Fellow is Bomani Oseni McClendon, and he's working on developing an outreach uh, outreach and educational uh, toolkit that makes machine learning accessible for artists and students. And um, he's also working with, with students from a very young age. Um, in addition to his educational practice, he's also studying the ways that Black health outcomes are influenced by a history of scientific racism. So um, you'll see that a lot of the artists that we feature in the field scan have um, very uh, diverse arts practices, and a lot of them are working around that um, arena of social justice. So you can learn more about artists and projects um, by other fellows on the Processing Foundation website. There's a, also a whole section on educational tools and curriculums built by teachers who use processing. So um, 
there's just a lot of stuff there. So as I wrap up on this section on tool building, I just again want to point out that many of the artists featured in the publication have these multifaceted practices and are working to bridge digital divides, advance digital literacy, and build 21st century skill sets. So um, also in the report, we have um, unpacked a lot about the context and disciplines. There's um, a lot just talking about um, how artists are working across disciplines and genres. We're talking a lot about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and works that bridge the two spaces of virtual and physical. And we also talk a little bit about how traditional arts disciplines are augmented and extended by the use of technology, uh, but they're not replaced. So really when we're talking about this field, um, it's really a lot of those people who fall kind of at the fringe of all of these traditional artistic disciplines coming together. So the um, other part of the report is all around navigating the ecosystem. So um, we spend a lot of time on this in the report and really the purpose of this is to help outsiders understand and find artists and identify hotspots and learn how to support artists in this field. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the communities and the hubs and gathering places and also just briefly go over some entry points and strategies that um, artists are using to make a living. Um, there are three interconnected pillars of support. Um, and uh, even though technology-centered artists frequently rely on internet-based resources, many of you will be happy to know that physical hubs and traditional in-person gathering spaces are not obsolete. Um, so those still play as an essential role in the professional and artistic development of artists. So um, exhibitions, presentations, and workshops are all critical uh, resources for artists. Furthermore, it's important to know that there's a few decades worth of artists, collectives, organizations, festivals, and conferences that are founded by artists and practitioners to fill voids in the arts ecosystem. And many of the entities that you see here are founded on a communal ethos with the desire to create opportunities for both themselves and others, uh, and to openly spark curiosity exploring this intersection of arts and technology. So each of these entities is part of a constellation of networks that builds on local expertise and responds to scientific needs, which, um, or specific needs, which in turn contributes to local, regional, and national networks. So in the published report, we include an appendix of more than 200 artists, uh, arts and tech centered entities, which will put some new uh, organizations on your radar. So to illustrate how an artist engages with this interconnected ecosystem, we'll use the example of Darcy Neal. She's an artist featured as a case study in our report. She's an artist that combines sculpture, music, and electronics in her work. And she was even commissioned by Wayne Coyne of the Flaming Lips to build a custom instrument that generates audio by reacting to light. And to fabricate her projects, she really relies on maker spaces and fabrication labs uh, to use the tools, the space, and interact with other community makers. So um, when we talk a little bit about entry points, um, there are various entry points that make this field accessible to individuals. And here are some examples of frequently cited organizations and entities. Um, so meetups, online forums, and demo parties are all things that are really important for artists and important to support. Um, and so some of the organizations that are frequently cited are ID, IO Festival, Gray Area Foundation, and Refresh, um, which is an artist-led collaborative um, that is um, a group of curators. So anyway, I would just go and check out these organizations if they weren't already on your radar. And um, it might not be a surprise to know that many artists are also facing disparities in access to equipment and training. And this is again, uh, mostly due to a digital divide that cuts along the lines of race, gender, and class. So there are a growing number of newer organizations entering the field that are specifically focusing on uplifting communities that have historically experienced, experienced limited access to technology. And here's a few examples of those. We have Afrotectopia, 
code liberation and color coded. So some of these access points can really provide life-changing moments that pave the pathway to a new artistic practice. And Stephanie Dinkins is one of those artists. Uh, she's also profiled in the report. And so her background really wasn't originally in digital technologies, but now um, she's really focusing on artificial intelligence and making a space for blackness within that space. So uh, we have a video with Stephanie as part of the report and a case study around here. So um, you'll be uh, hopefully looking forward to seeing that. Um, so moving on to strategies for making a living, um, some of the key findings that we unpack about income sources probably won't be too much of a surprise. Artists are juggling multiple income streams. Um, they have portfolio careers, which are mixing artistic production with research and field building, client-based works, teaching, and other gigs and partnerships. Um, artists are also working in the private sector and open the doors um, between uh, non-commercial and commercial artistic projects. And a lot of the artists are entirely self-employed and produce both artworks and work for clients in media, entertainment, and technology industries. Out of the 70 artists that we collected from, approximately half of them had founded entities such as artist studios, nonprofits, software companies, businesses, and other organizations. So through such endeavors, the artists are really contributing to creative economies as employers, and they're also ambassadors for the creative uses of tech and managers of organizations that provide resources and physical gathering spaces. So um, to take a look at one of these career paths, we um, chose Amelia Winger Bearskin as um, one of the case studies to do a deeper dive on. And Amelia has carved a career path that ranged from arts creation to university teaching and administrative work and also project management. And her practice also explores the ways that native and indigenous perspectives and value systems can inform foundational components of the tech industry. So a lot of her arts practice focuses on developing access points for voices underrepresented in the creative tech space. A few examples of the projects are outlined here. Um, Idea New Rochelle, which is a community arts and technology space. Wampum Codes, which is a podcast featuring in indigenous artists and technologies, um, artists and technologists working with digital tech. Um, and her career really demonstrates one of the ways that artists are contributing to arts and tech sectors beyond their creative work. Um, so now that you have a better understanding of the ecosystem, the next step for future supporters is to really think about what we can do together to support tech-centered arts practices. So um, many of the opportunities that exist um, to, there are a lot of ways that artists and um, non-arts people can work together. Um, so we are really focusing on um, encouraging people to think about ways that they can work and partner with tech-centered artists to connect audiences across physical and virtual spaces. Um, we are also hoping that people consider their role um, in seeing how they can work with artists to um, address racial inequities across the arts and tech and other sectors. And also um, tech-centered artists are really skilled in engaging local communities and addressing social issues. So um, I really want to have that kind of be one of the takeaways. Uh, so if you are someone who's looking to partner on different things or collaborate on projects, um, maybe look towards some of these resources and think about what you can do together. Um, so I have this quote from John Maeda, and this is actually one of the opening statements to the report. And um, we included this I included this in the presentation because we all know his ties with MIT, but also um, I really love that he said that there's never been a more important time in history for artists to make their needed mark with the right set of computational tools to humanize our collective future. And um, to me, that says that we're all stakeholders in this field in um, opening up those pathways to allow artists to work on this side and open up the pathways and the pipelines that also infuses these technology-centered artists into um, the places where they haven't been before. So 
There's some artist challenges that we also capture in the report, and I'm sure it's no surprise that um, more infrastructure is needed to help support artists. Uh, that's both from um, opening up ways to um, connect artists with tools or artistic and professional development opportunities, um, and also um, opportunities to create work through commissions and opportunities to exhibit and distribute their work and get it to places where it's not normally seen. We also profile um, some of the challenges for arts organizations. And again, more infrastructure is needed to develop organizational capacity. Some of the things that often came up were that organizations just weren't prepared either uh, through their staff, they, they didn't have tech expertise on staff, or they didn't have the right infrastructure to support the projects. Um, and there also just weren't programs that specifically supported technology-centered works. Um, so to me, this also um, says that we should be developing stronger networks between the organizations who are supporting this work and those who aren't. So we, there could be some really ripe opportunities for resource sharing and knowledge sharing. So the six recommendations that we have um, I was feeling really colorful last night, so I put them all in different colors, but the colors don't mean anything. Um, so really, uh, the six recommendations would be to expand expertise and tech capacity of organizations and artists. Um, I would also encourage anybody who's running arts programs or non-arts programs to think about their program priorities and outreach plans and think about ways that you can include this type of work and um, spark this type of activity. Also, um, we're looking for ways for people to infuse project development or exhibition opportunities or new initiatives. We're also looking for people who are lifting barriers to collaborating across arts and non art sectors. So a lot of this work um, does affect the uh, STEM sectors. So um, any types of uh, projects that are uh, spurring these collaborations are really fruitful at this moment. And um, equally important as bringing the arts and the non-arts together is really embedding arts and technology driven assets into the broader cultural infrastructure. And oftentimes they're two separate things or arts communities think about technology as just general social media or a website, but um, it's actually so much more than that. So um, any help that you could be in um, really making this just part of the 21st century creative ecosystem is a huge step forward. And also, um, last but not least, um, finding ways to deepen public understanding of this field's value and impact. And as we talked a lot about earlier, a lot of these artists are um, working to bridge the digital divides. They're teaching the next generation of artists. and. Um, they're also really tackling some of these larger issues, um, larger social issues through their use of technology. So um, we also have in the report, uh, we'll be releasing a series of commissioned essays also that are about uh, people's ideas around what's next and what could you be doing? Um, so we have a pretty exciting lineup of commissioned essays and we just got the final batch last week. So I'm super excited to read them, but um, these people are all amazing arts practitioners and they're gonna be just honing down on some of these recommendations. So I hope that you read them when they come out on the 29th. So going back to the very beginning of this, um, if you already have an idea for a project application to the Arts Endowment, please um, let us know. We do accept applications for artistic and professional development opportunities and opportunities for public experience. All of this is on our website. We encourage you to check it out. Um, competitive projects would be at least meeting one of these objectives. And you'll see that um, outside of some of the big ones like increasing paid opportunities for artists and providing public opportunities, um, we're really looking to uh, support projects that contribute to the infrastructure for artists and digital capacity building for organizations. Um, we're also looking at new models and um, other types of field building projects. So um, if you're interested in that and uh, you've gone to our website and look at all of our materials, uh, you're welcome to reach out to us and we will do the best that we can to connect you with the right resources. The next deadline's coming up in July. So um, now's a good time to be thinking about that. And with that, um, I guess that is the end of my presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
All right. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's an incredible report. I can't wait to read it so much there. It must, how long did it take you? The report? Yeah. It feels like forever. Um, but we started working on it in 2019. Um, and all last year during the pandemic basically was like working on the narrative work and we're still working on the case studies, uh, the case study videos and all of these things. And um, we finally just passed the report off for design like last week. So um, our designers have their hands full right now trying to get this done for the, um, the launch. But yeah, it's taken a while and our brains like have just been thinking about this topic for, for a long time. Yeah. Wonderful. I'm sure we have questions from our panelists and from the audience. Um, does anyone from any panelists want to have a question? All right, Halsey. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Jax. This is a particularly exciting area for me as I'm an artist who develops technology and all this stuff. So it's super exciting for me. Thank you. I'm very excited for the report. But I, I was wondering, I had numerous questions, but I thought perhaps the one I would ask now um, is in the realm of uh, sort of corporate responsibility in this field. I, I think I'm gonna invoke <laughs> Golan Levin again. And I think it was he who said something along the lines of, you know, artists, artists technologists are the unpaid R&D uh, group of Madison Avenue, um, which I think might sound harsh, but there's a lot of truth to that. And um, just in the sense that uh, a lot of these wonderful open source projects that are developed and built, you know, on shoestring budgets by artists toiling um, are then taken by, you know, not illegally, perfectly legally taken and used. And, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the sort of responsibility that maybe those corporations directly have or mm -hmm. um, to sort of feed back into this community or fund these uh, opportunities or, or projects and whatnot. And I know some do, and um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think about this a lot um, because it does seem very unfortunate that the artist-driven technologies be, are, aren't, um, competitive in, in a marketplace. And when people think about technology, they often want it to be profitable and they want it to become like the next big startup. And um, yeah, it is like this um, very challenging space right now for artists who are running technology companies because it's hard for them to get investors. It's hard for funders in the arts field to actually understand the purpose of their work because they themselves think the technology should be profitable. Um, even during COVID, I think people were just getting a little obsessive of how do you monetize all of the streaming happening? And um, like, these are the, the million dollar questions about like, oh yeah, like how do we support all of this? And working at a government agency, it's interesting. So um, the media arts portfolio only has about $5 million for the entire United States, we don't have a film office per se, we don't have a, a tech office. Um, so I think a lot about antitrust law and big tech and what corporate responsibility could be. And I actually had this um, different feeling about it the other day where um, I'm sure some of you have read in, uh, Lena Khan's Amazon antitrust paradox. Um, and it's a really brilliant if you haven't, but uh, definitely read that. She's one of the uh, people that they've, they're nominating to put on um, the FTC with uh, Tim Wu. And he's also uh, one of the people who had coined uh, the term net neutrality. And you know, I was thinking about like, well, what happens when we do break up big tech? Because there's a lot of conversation about that, but then actually I think that that destroys a little bit of the pipeline. So to me, I'm starting to think about like, how do we mobilize the field to really think about ways of um, pushing that corporate responsibility in a way that's not just about them saying, okay, we're gonna take, we're gonna take $100 million and, and support artists through this or support the community through this community benefit agreement because oftentimes those things still benefit their, their bottom line. So how do we actually hold some of the larger tech companies responsible for making such a vast inequity in the marketplace? And that's really what it comes down to. It comes down to that in film as well. Um, with all the dis digital disruption in film, it's we have a very inequitable marketplace for people who don't have that capital to develop or participate. And 
uh, we have such pressure to scale technology as well. And it really shouldn't be like that when these are these are things that are about like building community. These are threads of the community coming together. So um, yeah, I'm I'm also interested in this. And there's honestly, it's I would love to talk more about this because I think um, you know, there's a lot of people in the film field talking about this as well. Um, so we're all affected by it. I don't I don't have an answer, but my thoughts are like how how do we unlock a pool to kind of um, break down that consolidation of wealth in big tech because I'm not against what they've done because some of it's quite brilliant. It's more about how, how do they give back in the same way that allows people to um, be sustainable in their own practices, in their own way. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we'll always be talking about underfunded artists, um, but this is a space that we're hoping to really get people to understand the value of it um, and the value of small projects too. Um, sometimes those have the most impact. Thanks, Artemis, you have a question. Yeah, just to uh, dovetail on that. I mean, I, I really love the way you're so committed to um, this idea of new technologies being shaped by culture and by individual uses, um, as opposed to being kind of just um, directly determined by the technology itself. And, um, and I was wondering if um, in the kind of the works that you've been exploring and artists you've been exploring, whether, um, whether any of those, whether you've come across anything that actually genuinely surprised you in terms of how uh, an artist or technologist used a technology. I mean, kind of along the lines of, you know, Nam June Pike's, you know, TV lab, mm -hmm. where suddenly there was this thing that nobody thought was plastic, that was um, a, such a, you know, had so many different expressive possibilities. Mm. Oh, man. <laughs> There's so many. Um, honestly, like, I feel like my last year has been like going on these ridiculous internet wormholes of just projects on projects on projects on projects. Um, oh, boy. Um, some things, actually, some of the things that surprised me the most were the most simple uses. Um, Lauren McCarthy is an artist. Uh, she's somebody who is featured in the report through the Processing Foundation Case Study. And she had done a project that's um, called Follower. And essentially what she would do is people could sign up to be followed. And um, she would actually let them know the morning of that they would be followed. And then by the time she was done following them, she would send a photo of, um, of that person sometime throughout the day. because she'll you would never see her follow you. And um, this app really was playing on that concept of people so thirsty for social media followers and about being seen and all, all of these different things. So it's this the simplicity of using and building an app around that was interesting. And she also had done another performance where she was a human Alexa. Um, and so um, I think that there's a, a genuine sense of humor in her work, which is just so smart and, um, and slight and um, deceptive in, in the way that it's brought about. But yeah, there's, there's so much happening out there and it's so impossible to know it all that I think it was just constantly surprising um, to just see how, um, and, amazingly rich and smart uh, people's minds are, and also going into a lot of complex research and applying that in, in new ways. Great, we have, we'll take one question from the audience. Kevin Klein asks, he said, with the growing need to increase tech media literacy and competency, especially as a form of expression, how do we build the foundational youth education um, mm. competent experiences when they buy in, when the buy-in for tech is so mm -hmm. high and available funds to purchase and invest? That's a great question. And hi, Kevin. Uh, Kevin was actually one of my colleagues at um, Streaky Wheel, and he had spearheaded a lot of work in our youth media education sphere. So I know Kevin knows us firsthand how expensive it is to maintain a media lab these days. So, um, one of the things that really came up in the report is a lot of these open source uh, toolkits and uh, different projects are, are really where it's at, I think. And that's what's making um, 
you know, I don't think it's always necessary to have the latest and greatest tools. A lot can be done with the old stuff. And it's about um, getting into the mindset. And um, I guess as, as I was going through this report, um, when we talk about exploring the work, we put a lot of time into understanding that mindset. And again, that's about learning how to take apart tools and think about how they work um, and how that process uh, can be reflective of the, the concepts that you're trying to convey. Um, so I think training youth to really do a lot with a little might be the trick. Uh, so that way they don't get stuck in that mindset of always wanting the next thing because that can get really expensive and there's still, um, there's not only a monetary curve, but there's a learning curve. And to get people first, just um, able to be fluid in approaching a tool, um, I think that's probably the most valuable foundation that somebody could have um, and developing that like that inquisitive mindset. Um, yeah, probably the most versatile. Uh, Maya Darren, uh, who is a pioneering uh, filmmaker, uh, she has a really great essay on the um, the amateur, amateur. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember how it goes, but it's it's just really the the um, best tool in your toolbox is your mind. On that note, we'll have to end. Um, thank you so much, Jax. It's so exciting to see this report, you know, that you're shedding light on this group of people and aggregating in a field that we talked earlier that doesn't really, that tends to fall through the cracks, a lot of these people. So putting them together is wonderful. And I'm sure it'll generate a lot of discussion and hopefully action. Um, and thank you to all the panelists and to everyone out there for being here today. Um, as I said, this is the last talk of the semester, but we will be back in September. So have a wonderful summer. <laughs>